Uh, I'm going to ask our next speaker to come forward. Uh, this is Anne Polk. Please come forward, Anne. And um, I had the privilege of meeting uh, Christopher and Anne yesterday for the first time, and it's great to have you with us here. Where are you from, Anne? I'm from Portland, Oregon. Okay, tell us a bit about that for those of us who we don't know. Describe it a bit to us. It's the uh, Rose City. We call ourselves the Rose City. We're, we have an international rose garden with test roses and new names for them all the time. But we're also known as the, uh, the weird capital of the West Coast. <laughs> Keep Portland weird is our motto. Even, so, more, even more weird than California. I would say. Oh. <laughs> We've got a wonderful mix of hippies and tattoos and piercings and you name it. That's us. So I don't fit in very well, strangely. And I know that you've enjoyed, you've enjoyed being here so far. You managed to get away yesterday and just have a, see a few of the sights. What did you manage to see yesterday? In well, I almost saw the Queen. Oh. We went to Buckingham Palace and really enjoyed the visit tremendously. Great. Well, we really look forward to what you've got to say to us as well. Uh, thank you to Christopher and thank you to you as well, Anne. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. a real quick um, update with who I am. I came out of the gay background many years ago. Um, I became a Christian in 1982, so I've been a Christian for a long time, and at that time I surrendered my life to Christ. I also left behind homosexuality, so that was a number of years ago. Let's say I'm a bit older than I'd like to admit, but there you go. Um, okay, let's see where we are here. Based upon leaving homosexuality myself, it mattered a great deal what science had to say and the biases and whether or not change could happen. Um, my Christian faith led me to believe one thing. I'll be sharing more about that in the afternoon, so you hear my story a little bit more completely then. So let's just look at the information that I've come to uh, learn over the years. Um, of course, in 1973, the American Psychological Association, spearheaded by Dr. Robert Spitzer, removed homosexuality from the DSM-4, or the DSM-3 going into the version of the DSM-4. And he, a humanist, secular humanist, very in favor of gay rights, he was thrilled to do so. He did not foresee the potential of removing change as a possibility for those who sought it. Um, and so 20 years within that time, the gay community in the U.S. had really accomplished a great deal and was looking at putting uh, a ban completely on help for those who had unwanted same-sex attractions like myself. So we came to that conclusion very rapidly. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster so we can catch up just a bit. Um, but instead of stopping with the basis of what a client's self-determined goal was, which is the basis of psychotherapy in the US, um, the gay activists masquerading as scientists and professionals attempted to convince governments and government and health organizations to eliminate the option for um, help leaving behind same-sex attraction, which of course is what we're seeing today. Um, that was put off for a time because well, I'll explain that in just a moment. But the strategy at that time, 20 years ago in the US, was to ban therapy for those who were looking to leave uh, homosexuality or had unwanted same-sex attraction. And they were, uh, the attempt was coming from those who were embracing homosexuality. And so therefore, it really didn't represent the people who were leaving or seeking to leave homosexuality. And that's the very same scenario we have today. We have gay advocates and gay individuals saying, no, harm comes from leaving the thing that we deem as good. Homosexuality being a good should not be left, and therefore it is harmful to even seek care. And minimizing those who had unwanted same-sex attraction, an awful lot of people I've come to know over the years have felt distressed with their same-sex attraction and have wanted to resolve that in the way of leaving it behind. And those who were told, no, you cannot do so, came under a greater stress, personally, and internal distress. So what we're having today, of course, is a resurgence of that very same thing of prohibiting or banning care for those who want to direct their care towards leaving homosexuality. And it's a really over, a big overstep. 
of this body of people and the ideology involved. Um, 20 years ago, I suppose it was 20 years ago. My goodness, time has flown. 21 years ago, I was on the Oprah Winfrey show with Dr. Uh, Richard Isay, a psychologist who had left his family and identified as a gay individual, but that was not disclosed. Um, he had also, he was very much on the circuits of the American TV, major news outlets, um, much like um, Schroeder and Shidlow and uh, Dr. Jack Drescher and a number of others who were welcomed immediately upon CNN and MSNBC and a bunch of other shows without disclosing that they're from a gay uh, ideology. They're gay identified individuals who are psychologists. Um, they simply do not disclose the information. You actually have to do the research. Richard Haldeman, another one, uh, University of Washington. Um, he, these folks end up on TV just like that. But those of us who would say we had unwanted same-sex attraction are not as welcomed on TV. Do I have that right, Michael Davidson? Absolutely. So here I was on a panel as someone who had experienced change with my husband at the time. We were newly married, sitting next to Dr. Richard Isay. And on the break, I said, Doctor, he claimed, um, a gay gene would soon be shown. And it was heralded as the evidence that there is a gay gene. Rapidly, it was assumed, and it was delivered to Oprah Winfrey's viewers as if it were true. And all it took was one gay researcher saying a gene would be proven to be shown. Ten years later, when it was presumed to be the truth, without the evidence backing it up, Dr. Dean Hamer admitted in the gay publication called The Advocate that there is no gay gene. Ten years later, when it was no longer relevant as an ideological movement, you see. But during the break on the Oprah Winfrey show, I said to Dr. Isay, Dr. Isay, the study of the brain research, tell me, um, could we prove that the cadavers that they studied defined those portions of their brains that were different for gay individuals versus heterosexual individuals? Did you know how much consumption of homosexuality or did you really know their identity or behavior? After all, they are indeed dead. Do you know the details behind their lives? Was it high porn use or could those things be related to who knows what number of factors? And he admitted to me that the research was fairly weak. So it was fascinating. It was captured on mic, on the break, and had they wanted to air that, here would be a Bachelor of Science graduate, mind you. I'm not a doctor. Dr. Isay has his doctorate. And I confronted him. He admitted his error. And it could have easily been presented in the news and media, but it was not. And that is the condition of the information getting out today as well. It's a tragedy. Again, the bias of the researchers is what I would like to point out. The research itself has been reviewed by Dr. Uh, Rosick. But the actual people doing the research, even the LDS study, um, were actually gay-affirming individuals and perhaps gay-identified individuals. I don't know this last group if they were gay-identified, but the people Ariel Shidlow, Michael Schroeder, Douglas Haldeman, Richard Isay, Jack Drescher, the APA Division 44 is handily given over to people who are gay-identified and not allowed to have any representation from those of us who are no longer. Fascinating. Of course their research results would be biased based upon that. They also sought to produce evidence of harm. In the end, Schroeder and Shidlow had to show that there was some benefit, actually, because their research uh, individuals would not only give harm, they also gave some help. They received help at the same time, and they had to concede that there were degrees of help, even though they were only seeking harm. And their goal, written right there, or initially our goal was to document negative effects and harm done by conversion therapies, which of course they included um, things that are not done, aversion therapy, that is just not the case 
where people are using pornography, ice baths, and electroshock therapy. And yet those claims have made their way into Washington state legislatures in an attempt to ban therapy for individuals. What we're talking about is talk therapy and pastoral care. It's so dangerous. <laughs> it's just so horrible that people would care for individuals and want to help them in the direction that they would like to have help. It's so harmful. Just disaster, isn't it? But no, because it's difficult to prove that that is disaster, they have to rope in these things that are extreme and ridiculous, that are irrelevant to the discussion. Talk therapy and prayer counseling and just caring for individuals. Pastoral care is delightful and wonderful, especially for those who have some training. So irrelevant emotive arguments were looped in intentionally. Of course, they were biased against those who were seeking, who left the change process. So 15 years ago, literally, it came down to a point where we almost saw the banning and the removal of licensing of those who were helping others leave homosexuality. And in that, in light of it, we protested in front of the APA convention on a street that had almost no traffic whatsoever. We had no idea that the place that we were going to had almost no one walking by it. It was this corner with this big area. And honestly, um, there was simply no one going by. The one person who walked by amazingly was Dr. Robert Spitzer. And in this time, here we see uh, Frank Worthen, who's a founder of Exodus International. He was one of the original founders who remained on task as far as his whole entire life. And he's um, a, a spiritual father to me as well. And he also helped to start this new network that I have begun, which is Restored Hope Network. Um, we all held signs and we protested for our rights to leave homosexual behavior. And Dr. Spitzer walked by which ensued with a conversation with a humanist who had, was a gay advocate, but he didn't want to see our rights trampled on either, which brought him to the point of studying. Can we indeed, or can people leave homosexuality at all? Because that's what was being said. It cannot be done. And of course, that's what is being said today, isn't it? Up until the advocacy of Dermot and Peter Mays and and Mike Davidson asking your uh, Royal College about exactly why and how they came to their conclusion and having them revise with scientific basis their statements. So Sp uh, Spitzer spearheads another courageous movement to answer the question, can some individuals change? Is there harm? And he did a pretty rigorous study that has since he's renounced the study because he didn't like how it was used after it was done, but there was nothing done wrong with the, with the methodology. And in fact, the APA, um, it was I think it was behavioral sex or sexual, eth what was the name? I forget where it was. Um, oh, Archives of Sexual Behavior, volume 32. They refused to remove it because uh, the methodology was fine. The outcomes were based upon the data itself. He just didn't like the way some people were using the study to make vast um, uh, statements about it. But they had 247 responders, 16 month study, and the majority of the participants did report change from predominantly or exclusively homosexual orientation to a predominantly or exclusively heterosexual orientation. Did change happen? We, under the supervision of a secular humanist who was pro-gay, yes, he, he documented that change is possible from ahead of the APA. That did not make him very popular amongst the gay activists or the gay researchers, did it? Um, I'll take questions at the end. Yeah. Spitzer concluded in that statement, the mental health professionals should stop moving in the direction of banning therapy, which is exactly where we were at the time, that has as a goal a change in sexual orientation. These are his words at the time of the study. Many patients provided with informed consent about the possibility that they will be disappointed if therapy does not succeed can make a rational choice to work towards developing their heterosexual potential and minimizing their unwanted homosexual attractions. 
Those are the words of Dr. Robert Spitzer. The ability to make such a choice should be considered fundamental to client autonomy and self-determination, which is exactly the challenge that we have today. And it's not just in the US, it's not just in the UK, but this is spreading around the world. Um, and it's manifesting itself through the United uh, Nations as well, and pressuring other nations. Client autonomy and self-determination of goals is simply being stepped on. And I cannot hear of it because I myself sought to leave the homosexual life and successfully did so. Harm, to the contrary, says they reported that it was helpful in a variety of ways behind, beyond changing sexual orientation itself. And I have found that to be true in my life as well. In fact, I was a research uh, individual in that study. I was one of the persons who answered the questions. And he also found that um, those of us who were answering the questions were not deceptive. We didn't say that we had had uh, perfect change. In fact, he said the data supported the fact that there was authentic a re revelation of the person's experience. They didn't say they went from uh, all homosexual attraction to only heterosexual lusty attraction. No, no, it wasn't broadly swept. The, the data showed a variety of responses, but in general, people were helped towards the direction of re re uh, restoring their uh, heterosexual potential. So, his conclusion, the ability to make such a choice should be considered fundamental, fundamental, and it was helpful, and considerable benefit with no harm, Spitzer said. So stop applying a double standard in its discouragement of reorientation therapy while actively encouraging gay-affirming therapy. Hmm. He wasn't against gay affirming therapy, you see, but he also stood for the rights of those who sought to change. So over a third reported at that time that they had seriously contemplated suicide due to dissatisfaction with their unwanted same-sex attractions. So is there harm indeed? for preventing people with unwanted same-sex attraction from leaving same-sex attraction. They don't want it, you want to hold them there, well guess what, there might be an outcome of depression and suicidal thoughts as a result of that because these folks are wanting to align their desires with their faith or their ethics, their sexual ethics, and if you intend to, as a nation, prevent that, then there is harm, potentially in enforcing what you cannot change, period. And we will not allow anyone to help you. That is exactly where we're at today, which is tragic. Gay activists in the form of gay identified psychologists would rather remove the option for those who seek talk therapy and Christian pastoral care because they don't want to pursue it. But who is forcing them to? We are not. We simply want our right respected as well. What about Spitzer's retraction? Nothing in the science of the study warranted retraction, so they refused to retract it from the medical journals. Where does that leave the Christian with unwanted same-sex attraction? Christian counseling associations in various countries, including the US, well, actually, not in the US yet. Let's hope it holds off in that area. But professional organizations are really struggling with or about to ban therapy for those who seek to align their lives with their biblical sexual ethics or morals, their own religious perspectives that they would like to align with. It's almost as if the gay activists and their allies would rather have depressed suicidal individuals than allow them to find care for leaving homosexuality. Restorative ministries. The network that I run of Christian ministries um, really grew out of the uh, demise of Exodus. We realized that Exodus International was failing a couple of years before it actually collapsed. And we confronted the leadership of that. I used to be on the board of directors of, Restore, of Exodus International. I was a national spokesperson for many years, which is how I was on the Oprah Winfrey show 20 years ago. 
um, 21 years ago, and um, uh, I helped to hire Mr. Alan Chambers, who is the executive director, president of Exodus. So I speak from this point of view that actually I have a very, very knowledgeable understanding of what brought about the demise of Exodus International, who they were, and what his apology meant when he left. But out of that, and I suppose I'll share more about it in a little bit, I'm going to need to get off the stage in about two minutes. So anyway, out of the demise of Exodus and recognizing it was failing and it was about to spiritually and leadership-wise and, uh, and, and organizationally implode, uh, we actually tried to establish something that would revitalize it. And when that failed, we began Restored Hope Network. Restored Hope Network is now a member is a network overseeing 50 different groups across the US. And there are several more that need to go onto this uh, picture now. But every month we add two or three more. It keeps climbing um, and, and that's exciting. We want to see help for each individual state that would, has people that are seeking help for change. There are hurting individuals all across the US and likely the UK and many other places that are seeking care. And I'm happy to stand alongside of them, as I was happy that others stood alongside of me. So counselors, church, parachurch ministries to help individuals align their lives with their goals is what we're here for. And eliminating care for individuals with unwanted same-sex attraction is indeed the activist goal. And it has been just simply revitalized after 20 years of attempting it, 20 years prior, that was not successful. And of course, I love this quote from Winston Churchill, an appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile hoping it will eat him last. And honestly, I think now's the time to stand up against the crocodile that would prevent those who are seeking care from getting it. In fact, I would go so far as to say that in light of the medical evidence, the psychological distress from those who want to leave homosexuality and being prevented to, from doing so, that I would say that governments who outlaw such help and organizations and institutions may be culpable in the outcome of medical issues such as HIV transmission, depression and suicide, and harm indeed that comes from preventing individuals from seeking the care that they seek, they desire. They may indeed become parties to the demise of the youth of the US who are contracting HIV and AIDS at a, an astounding rate. And as you saw there, it was 90% men having sex with men from young boys from 13 years old up to 24. They're the highest body of people who are contracting HIV and AIDS, it's a completely preventable disease and we're allowing to spread rapidly and only encouraging individuals to not change, only gay affirming therapy. And all I would suggest is that we deserve the right to pursue change if we so seek it. Thank you very much.